are starting a new series today called Everyday Disciple. And uh, if you've been here for a few months, you've heard us talk about our mission statement at Long Hollow, which is living out, this is what we want to collectively do, uh, just kind of as a broad scale and personally. We want to live out our God-given calling as we follow Jesus and make disciples every day. Now, the question becomes, how do you do that, right? Like, what does that look like? And so for the next few weeks, starting today and three more, I will talk about the traits of an everyday disciple. And we're going to start with one, I think, kind of gives a picture of every other one, and that is we need to be or should be spirit-led followers of God. Wouldn't you agree? We need to be spirit-led followers of God. Now, let me give you some context before we really get into the message. We all know today what war is like. I mean, you don't have to turn on the television and, and look long. You don't have to read the paper without seeing it because of the war of Ukraine versus Russia, right? We see it now. And one of the things we learn about war is that there are certain things that have to happen to prepare for battle. Like you have to have the certain or right kind of ammunition or guns. You have to have the right kind of food or enough food on the battlefield, right? I mean, you got like certain things. You got to prepare to go into battle. You have to have the right mindset to go into battle. But most importantly, you have to realize you're in a battle. When you don't go into a battle realizing you're in a battle, you're already defeated. Friends, you and I as Christians are in a similar battle. The difference is we fight a different enemy. In fact, we have three the world, the devil, and our flesh. And so what I wanna talk about today in our time together is the internal enemy, the flesh, that we still battle as Christians. You gotta understand, the moment you became a believer or were converted or born again, something happened to you. You went from death to life, but something else happened. God does not hold, don't miss this, the penalty of our sin against us, right? The penalty for your sin is removed. However, the power of sin is still there. And so just because we're a Christian doesn't mean that we're not tempted, right? Or we don't have consequences for our sin. So what I wanna talk about today is this. What does it look like for us to be spirit-led followers of Christ in order to experience a joyful life, an abundant life, a victorious life, a fulfilling life. Anybody want to learn how to live that kind of life? I know I do. Amen? Anybody excited to be here? Anybody at home excited to be here as well? If you have a Bible, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. We'll be in the epistle of uh, the church of Galatia. Paul writes this epistle to them. And we're going to start in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Now, what he's going to talk about here is, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? And he's going to talk about how we can do this in this battle that goes on between the flesh. We like to say word at Long Hollow. If you're there, you can say word. word. Verse 16, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These two are opposed. This is where I get the battle from. It's the word conflict. It's the word fighting. These two are battling one another so that you don't do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. I want to give you two contrasts here. One is walking by the flesh, and the other is what does it mean to walk by the Spirit. If you're taking notes, write down this. Walking by the flesh imprisons you. Walking by the flesh imprisons you. The word walk, before we kind of get into the text, doesn't just mean walking physically, although it does. I mean, when Jesus called people, he said, come follow me, come walk after me. When God called Abraham, go on a long walk. Moses, you're going to be walking for... So the whole Christian life is a walk. But it's bigger than that, right? Because walking, coming close, means the manner of which you live. It's the totality of your life. It's the way you speak. It's the way you act. It's the way you live. And so all of us are born into the world by natural birth with a nature of the flesh, okay? This is against God. But then when we become believers or born again, we are given a spiritual birth, which is the Holy Spirit living in us, and these two are going to constantly battle one another. Now, you know this. If you've ever been convicted over sin, you ever felt that? 
if you uh, be tempted to do something wrong or the consequences of sin. We call that the flesh and the spirit. Now, don't miss this. The word flesh doesn't mean like, like this skin suit we're in, right? I mean, this is not what he's talking about. He's talking about human nature. He's talking about our predisposition to sin without having to teach someone how to sin. And just because you're a Christian in here, you know this, you're not immune to sin, right? I mean, I don't see many halos. I do see some shiny heads, but I don't see any halos, right? It looks like a few heads, but it's not a halo, right? So all of us have a propensity to sin. Now, Paul's gonna give us a list to determine some of the sins in our life. The list is not exhaustive, obviously, but he gives us a, a kind of a running start to look at the flesh. Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. In a, in a sense, it's fruit of the flesh. You have fruit of the spirit, fruit of the flesh. This is what the flesh does. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, Outburst of anger. Anybody checked a few boxes? All right, right? I mean, got kind of a running star. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. Paul said, listen, that's a good list, but anything close to this is basically the flesh. I am warning you about these things, as I've warned you before, that those who practice, this is the word, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if I had a whole sermon, if I had a whole nother sermon, I could preach this, this line right here. Inherit the kingdom of God. Don't think tomorrow in the by and by and eternity when the roll's called up yonder, I hope I'm there. That's not what he's talking about. Part of it, yes, but that's not all he's talking about. Paul's talking about how do you inherit or live in the kingdom today? That's what he's talking about. And what he's gonna show us is this list is gonna tell us a few things. Now, He's not talking about sinning in general, because all of us look at that list and we say, hey, we've, che we've checked those boxes before. He's not talking about sinning in general. He's not talking about messing up. Long haul, we all mess up. Here's what he's talking about. The word practice there shows us that he's talking about the pattern, write this down, the pattern of your life. He's not saying you'll momentarily fall into sin. He's not saying you're gonna mess up, or you're not gonna mess up, we know that. He's saying that if this is the pattern of your life, two things are either happening here, one of two things. Because a Christian cannot keep on sinning as the pattern of their life. Now, 1 John 3, verse six tells us this. No one who abides in Jesus keeps on what? Let's, let's say that again. No one who abides in Jesus keeps on what? Sinning. Sinning. I, Mom, I know you hope and pray that the prayer your son said at eight years old at camp was real. But I say this with love. If they keep on sinning, Paul says no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. And then he says this way, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen Jesus or even knows him. Here's the question you ask yourself, three questions. Number one is this. Does sin dominate you? Does sin dominate you? Sister, does sin have a mastery over you? I'm not talking about falling in. I'm talking about the pattern of your life. I'm talking about the sum total of your life. Does immorality or idolatry or pride or arrogance or ambition or, or selfish ambition, does that control you? Now, what this list does is, is twofold, and I'll show you how to use this list. So what do we do with the list? Number one is, if you're a born-again Christian, watch this, you look at this list and you realize these are the actions that will quench the spirit working in my life. You can't expect to be spirit-filled and live a life of anger. You can't expect to be spirit-filled and always in fits of rage. This is not how it works. But what it also does is this, the list is a diagnostic test to determine if you're a believer and truly born again. Because Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, you will know a tree by the what? Fruit it bears. And so basically, here's how it works. If a person we know or yourself is living in sin, here's a question. If a person is living in sin, either one or two things is gonna happen. 
They're going to be a miserable person, and that is a miserable existence, because you're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit daily. You ever been there before? I have. I have. But if they're living in sin, here's the flip side. If they're living in sin and there is no conviction, then I would question if they're a Christian. Why? Because the hallmark of a believer is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's one of the ways you know how you're really, listen, when I was in the world, I said a prayer, I repeated a prayer, did it right, said it perfect, second year of college, Jeremy Brown led me through the prayer. I thought I was a Christian for two weeks. I did. And then I went back to living in the world. And for the next seven years, I lived to sin and I loved sin. Then I know it was morally wrong, yes, but there was no conviction of the Holy Spirit. One of the tests to determine if you're a true believer or not is this. How, watch this. This is it. How do you feel when you sin? Do you enjoy it or do you abhor it? That's the question. How do you feel? If you would ask Robbie pre Christ, I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. The worse, the better. Now, as a Christian on this side of the cross, I abhor it, sin, right? Conviction of sin, as I said, is the hallmark of the believer. And it's really a gift from God. Think of the kindness of God. Every time you do wrong, God gives you conviction, which says, this is bad for you. It's really bad. It's actually gonna ruin your life, so stop it. That's what God's saying. And then we have a choice. What do we do? Do we, do we listen or do we disobey? Now, here's an encouraging thing I wanna say, and I wanna say this to those who have a past that's checkered like mine. Isn't it encouraging to know that when you surrender your life to Christ, our past failures in the flesh are not held against us. And our past failures in the flesh do not define us, right? Aren't you glad? Like at the moment of conversion, those things are put to death and we are made alive again. Romans 6 uh, tells us this clearly in verse 6. Paul says, for we know that the old self, the way we used to live, was crucified with Jesus so that the body ruled by sin, I love this line, might be rendered powerless. It means to disarm a bomb. It's just a brick. That's what it means. It's to disarm a bomb. Basically, render sin has no power anymore after Christ so that we no longer will be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is freed from sin. Now watch verse 11. So you too consider yourselves, us, dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Anyone grateful for a clean slate the moment you got saved? Amen? I know I am. Anyone grateful that God doesn't hold our past against us? Anyone glad that at salvation we are a new creation in Christ? The old things have passed away. Behold, everything is new. That's what God does. But just because we're a new creation doesn't mean we're going to walk in the Spirit. And that's why Paul is going to give us this runway of how to live in the Spirit. Number two, Walking in the flesh will lead uh, to imprisonment. Walking by the Spirit will lead to freedom. Freedom. But it's not the freedom you think, by the way. It's not the freedom we think. Galatians 5, 25, or 22, sorry. But the fruit, and by the way, what tense is that word? Is it singular or plural? Singular. Somebody at the first service said, yeah, but it could be plural, like fruit salad. Or like fruit basket, uh, 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 fruit baskets. I was like, yes, but the Gre <laughs> the Greek tells us it's singular. That's a whole other story. In the Greek, it's interesting it, that it could be right. But in the Greek, the Greek language gives us an ending, which is a word or or a letter to tell us plural or singular. Unlike the English. So by the way, trust me, it's singular. Okay, but the fruit singular of the spirit. Now, what does that mean? There, you don't have fruits of the spirit. You have fruit. One fruit can manifest or express itself in varying degrees and to varying levels in your life. That's how it works. And the way it is expressed is through this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Anybody need help with any of these? Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now, those who belong to Christ, Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, 
If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, let me just say this before we start. The only way you and I can walk by the Spirit is after we have been born again, okay? And I know some, I had family members who say, I don't, I, don't, I don't need to be born again. I don't need to be saved, my mom used to tell me. I don't need to be saved. You need to be saved, son, because you were the one who strayed. I've always gone to church. That's what she would say. And you may say that, but you gotta understand, you need to be born again or converted, why? Because at the moment of conversion, that's when God sends the Holy Spirit to take up residence in your heart. And it doesn't matter how good your parents were, and it doesn't matter if you went to a private school like me, or a Christian school, or a Baptist school, or a Catholic school, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good you've been in the past. You need to ask the question, am I born again, and is the Holy Spirit of God living within me? That's the question. Because if you can't answer that question, everything else I tell you at this point won't help. It doesn't matter how many good things you do, why? Because you and I are in a constant battle with the flesh, and the only way we're gonna win is by the Spirit. Now, I already said the fruit is singular, but one of the things you gotta realize is there is an expression to degrees in life of this. Now, here's what I want you to see. The, the verse that got, gave me a, a reason to pause was verse 18. And as I read verse 18, I thought, this is an interesting way to put it. Paul says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. I mean, this is crazy, but when I was in seminary, I had guys say, man, I get drunk for Jesus. I'm free in the Spirit. I, I can smoke a joint for Jesus. I mean, I'm free, you know? And I'm like, what are you talking about, right? But that's kind of how the extreme, I mean, I can do whatever I want. I mean, I'm free. Nobody's going to tell me what the, the Bible says. I'm not under the law. Is that what Paul's saying? I don't think so. Here's what you got to understand. Just because you and I are free in the Spirit or filled with the Spirit doesn't mean that you and I can live any way we please at this point. In fact, God has set up a system or a standard. Don't miss this. And he said, if you follow and obey this standard, life's gonna go really well for you. You're gonna be, you're gonna be joyful, you're gonna have peace and satisfaction. However, you can disobey the standard, the commandments, the law, you can do that, but you're gonna experience death and rejection and separation and despair. It's up to you. The example I was thinking this week was uh, on the farm. And, and by the way, I don't know if you know, we are officially, officially, out of the hobby farming business. Can I get a hallelujah? <laughs> Reagan Ryder, not so happy. And I gave, I gave the boys every chance, and they're here and I'll, I'll tell you, I gave them every chance to keep the animals. Year one, everybody's excited. We're out there every day, we're feeding animals, we're watering, we're cleaning, the, you know, shoveling out the, um, the hay. I'll just say we shovel out the hay of the stalls. Uh, year two, it was sporadic. Year three, guess who would do it when he got home from the office? Yours truly, right here. And so I went inside and I said, listen, if we're gonna have animals, I need help. No participation, no appreciation, right, Brian? I mean, we, you work and you get. That's how it works in the Gallaty home. And they go, I don't wanna do it. And I said, all right, well, I'm getting rid of all animals. Okay, I'll do it. I said, I'll put you on a three-month period. Three-month trial period. Well, you know what happened. They're all gone, okay? And the last one to go, they're like, all right, I just couldn't get any help. Couldn't get any help around the house, you know? And Colin said, you may want to clarify that after the first service. You don't want people thinking you need Candy's help. But anyway, but anyway, but anyway, I wasn't talking about Candy, really. But anyway, the boys would, the boys would not help. True story. So I finally got rid of all the animals. The last one to go was Luke. Luke was or is a 110-pound Great Pyrenees. It's a beautiful dog. He's an amazing dog. It was the last one to go because we wanted to find, you remember we had Chewbacca, Chewie, he died, and Luke was, you know, Luke and Chewie, so Luke was left, and he was the last one to go, and we finally found him a good home. And you would think, like, if Luke could talk, let's just, for example, uh, imagine, if Luke could talk as he's about to leave, I'm like, hey, buddy, the reason you're still in this fence is that I'm trying to find you the right home. If Luke could talk, he would have said this to me. Hey, just open the gate and let me run free, Right? And honestly, looking at this 110-pound animal, I would say, you're probably right. You could probably make it. 
And it would seem like if I would open the gate and let him run free, it seems like, don't miss this, that that's real freedom. That being sequestered and hidden in the gate with a chain behind a fence would be, would be imprisonment. But actually, it's the opposite. See, because if I let him go, then he subjects himself to a lot of things that could hurt him. But if he's in the boundary of the fence, he has some things to his benefit. Number one is he's always going to have a meal every day because I'm gonna feed him, right? I mean, I'm gonna feed him, right? Nobody else, I'm gonna feed him. He's always gonna have protection, right? He's always gonna have uh, love and affection. He's not gonna run wild because outside the fence, he's susceptible to coyotes. He's susceptible to cars and he's susceptible to woods. So it, wolves, it may seem like freedom exists on the outside of the boundaries of the fence, but actually the freedom makes you a prisoner, why? because you're imprisoned to dog catchers and moving cars and lack of food and no shelter. So the freedom in the gate actually doesn't prevent his freedom. It actually, don't miss this, preserves and prospers his life. You get it? Now watch this. That's the commandments of God. God is saying to us, when you obey the commands by the Spirit, willingly and joyfully, life goes so much better for you. I promise you it will. And you can determine how you look at this, because I know how I used to. Do you look at the commands of God as restrictions to your happiness or expressions of his love? That's the question. Is that God trying to just keep me from having fun? Or is this the loving relationship with a father through intimacy by obedience? Let me give you an example. God's word says, do not steal. You've heard this, do not steal. Now at first glance, you may say, I don't like that command. That is preventing me from the freedom to steal. And I'm a Christian, I can do what I want. And you're right, you have the freedom to do what you want. The intended command is not for prevention, but actually for protection, I'll show you. Because the moment you go out and steal something, then at that point you are imprisoned to a story. You're imprisoned by not telling your friends what you did, you can't tell family what you did, you can't tell authorities about what you did. Now you run the risk if someone finds out that now you could go to jail, you can be imprisoned, you can be punished, you can be in debt for years. So God says, don't, don't lie, don't steal, why? Because you'll be tormented by your conscience. You have the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life. So what he said is, don't steal. Now here's the question. If you were to steal and have the freedom to steal, would it actually be freedom? Or would you be a prisoner to your own decisions and the consequences? See the difference? So what does God say? Don't steal. And trust me on this, I know. So here's the question again. Do you view the commands of God as restrictions of happiness or expressions of love? Now, here's the million dollar question. What does it mean to have freedom? Because the Bible says it's for freedom. Christ has set us free. What does it mean? You have freedom. You can do whatever you want. You have liberty. Adrian Rogers, pastor of, former pastor of Bellevue Baptist, used to say this line, it's one of my favorite lines he said. He said, some people say, he's talking about people who are born again and say, I can do what I want. Some people say, well, if I believed in this doctrine, then I'd get saved and I would sin all I want to. Dr. Rogers says, friend, I do sin all I want to and I sin more than I want to. The problem is I don't want to. Can I get a witness? <laughs> I don't want to. He said, when you get saved, you get your wonter fixed. <laughs> I love that. And as a matter of fact, you get a brand new wonter. What is he saying? You don't want to sin anymore. You don't want to mess up anymore. You don't want to engage in the filth anymore. Why? Because God changes your heart. Let me ask you this. Is there anything we can do, though, to create an environment for a filling and a prospering of the Holy Spirit in and through our life? And the answer is yes. Now, God's the one who sends the Spirit. God's the one who directs our life. God's the one who produces our fruit. 
But as a believer, you're gonna love this, we actually can do something synergistically with the Holy Spirit to create an environment for God to work. And it's found in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. You're gonna to wanna to see this if you have a Bible. Uh, hold your place at Colossians and then, and then Ephesians, and I want you to go back and forth. And if you don't have a Bible, you don't need it, but you can see the screen and then we'll go back and compare. But watch this interesting insight. Paul's gonna write two different letters to two different churches, and he's gonna interchange one line, but he's gonna use all the same material to prove a point, okay? So just follow this. Ephesians 5, 18. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. And when you're filled by the Spirit, you will speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. Now turn to Colossians 3, 16. Different beginning, same ending. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Okay, what are you trying to say, Robbie? When you take these passages and you're doing Bible interpretation, you will notice things that are similar or connected or parallelisms. I'm gonna show them to you. Ephesians chapter five, verse 19, and Colossians 3, 16 are almost word for word verbatim. Watch this. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. Teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Pretty simple, pretty similar, right? Next verse, verse 20. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.17, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now up to this point, everything's the same. But when you go back to the first line, they're different. They're different, but they're synonymous. You're gonna love this, watch this. Ephesians 5.16, and if in Colossians, or Ephesians 5.18, Colossians 3.16. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, forget that. Don't forget that, but forget that for now. Just for now, just for now, just for now, just for now. But be, filled, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Okay, that's the line. Let the word of Christ dwell richly, richly in your heart. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that we are filled with the Spirit of God as we let the word of God dwell richly in our heart. Listen, y'all laughed at me from day one when I used to say this. Y'all need to get in the word Word gets in. Friends, this is what I'm talking about here. When you get in the word, the word gets into you. You wanna be full of the spirit? Be filled with the word of God. Be filled. Listen, this is why I love this book. This is why I love this book so much, why? Because this book is not just a guide to life. This book is not just a map to live by. This book is a mirror to look through and to look at. Because when I read this book, I start to see two things. One is I see the awesomeness of God. I see how awesome Jesus is, but I also see how much and how often I fall short of the glory of God, but I see how perfect Christ was to fulfill it. Friends, if you're not, in, listen to me, if you're not in this book daily, you are already deceived by the enemy and you are losing the battle. I can almost assume if you are dealing with consistent, persistent sin right now, I can assume you're not in the Bible. D.L. Moody used to say, the Bible will keep you from sinning and sinning will keep you from the Bible. You know what I'm talking about? But Paul finishes with this amazing line and it's really a cool line. He says, but I want you to keep in step with the Spirit. Anybody caught that? Like, what does that mean? Keep in step with the Spirit. It's a word picture for a guide, a guide in life. Uh, for our 10 year anniversary, I took Candy on what she would say is the greatest trip we've ever been on. I took her to Italy. 
And I'd already been to Italy years before. My sister graduated from college and I was just getting off her drugs and alcohol. And my mom's like, somebody's got to go. And I'm like, if somebody's got to go, I guess I'll, I'll go. You know, I got to go. I'll go. You know, so I'll play. We went. It was awesome. And so I knew that. So we went back at our 10 year anniversary and it was amazing. I mean, we went to the Colosseum in Rome. We went and saw the Sistine Chapel. We went and saw David, uh, Michelangelo's David. We went in uh, the boat in Venice, and we ate gelato ice cream every night. I mean, it was awesome. I mean, it was all right. That's all I was there for. But anyway, it was awesome. So one of the things about the tour is we were about to go on this tour. We had a choice. Do we hire a company that will lead us and plan our day, or do we just get a car and see the country free? Like, we have freedom. Let's just have freedom and see the country. And while the second may seem like more freedom and the choice that we would take, actually the first was better. Why? Because of the restriction of the tour guide, the trip was more enjoyable. Why? You see, the tour guide knows the terrain. The tour guide knows the area better than we do. In fact, they would take us to places we never dreamed of. The tour guide plans your schedule. The tour guide plans your meals. The tour guide gets you, tour guide gets you from part A to part B. The tour guide knows that if you follow them, this is the best part, you'll never get lost. You just follow the tour guide. You'll never get lost. Don't miss this. Every believer at the moment of salvation is given a tour guide for life. His name is the Holy Spirit. And he knows what's best for you. Why? Because he made you. And he knows your future better than you know your own past. And he knows what direction you need to go. Why? Because he knows what comes ahead. And I promise you, he's a way better leader than you are. And if you follow him, here's the best news. You'll never get lost and he'll never let you down. How many times have you done things in life and never consulted the Holy Spirit? You know, we have a choice of what we're gonna do. And if you're like me, I think of many times I have done things without asking him for wisdom. I've never consulted him like I should. And so I just wanna challenge you as we close, two questions I'm gonna give you. And you wanna write these down. These are two diagnostic questions that you're gonna ask yourself and your D group or your life group, you can. And you're gonna ask these questions to determine if you are a spirit-led follower of God. And we work for these questions for months with our team. So these are not just Robbie created these. These are, like, these are questions you can think through diagnostically. Number one is this. What scripture is currently shaping me or shaping you? What scripture is, let me ask you that today. What scripture is currently shaping you, brother? If you don't have an answer, I would start there. If you don't commit to daily reading the word, then you're pretty much at a loss already. Number two is this. What has my attention, my thoughts, and my feelings or energy? What has my attention, my thoughts, and my energy? That's a great deep question. This shows if you're consumed by the flesh or the spirit. So here's what I wanna do. I believe in a room this size, there are some who would say, Pastor, I, I know the Lord, I know who he is, but I feel like I'm in a battle and I don't know if I am winning. Don't know if I'm winning. And I need freedom from my sin. I need freedom from this control. I'm not experiencing the kind of life Jesus promised for me. And so in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to come and just to stand here and I'm just gonna pray over you. I'm not gonna invite you back, although you can go back if you want. I'm not going to get your name. You can just literally just pray over you. And I'm going to pray for God to set you free. Why? Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And so I want you to stand on your feet right now. And as you're standing, if you're saying, Pastor Robbie, I want to experience that freedom. I, I don't know what you're talking about with this spirit filled life, but I want that. And again, you don't tell me what the sin is. You don't tell me what the issue is. You don't tell me what the challenge is. Uh, I'm just going to challenge you to come. And if you're desperate enough, I promise you, you will come. And so if you need to be prayed over, you come. And I don't know if it's a personal struggle or a family struggle, or maybe you're coming to stand in the gap and you're saying, Pastor, I have a son or a daughter who is not experiencing freedom. 
but would you pray over them? And so I'm going to pray and believe that God is going to set them free. So if you need prayer today, you come. Every head up, every eye open. Amen. And some of you may need to come if you're saying, I don't think, I think people are going to think something's wrong with me if I come. You probably need to come. Let's be honest. It's probably good for you to laugh at yourself more because everybody else is anyway, right? I mean, everybody knows they might think I have a problem. No, they already do, right? So come on, amen? You come and be prayed over. If you need to be set free, you come. And I don't know what it is, but God does. So I'm gonna ask you, others have come, so you come, amen. If you think, I wish I would've come when I got home, then you come, amen, you come. If you're desperate, you'll come, I promise. If you wanna see healing, you'll come. If you wanna encounter God, you'll come. We had a lady in the first service, they've been here for years and years, her husband, uh, you know him in this town, and uh, wife came forward that service and said, honey, I don't think I'm a Christian. If what he's talking about means that's what a Christian is, I don't think I'm a Christian. Lady was what, 60s, Russ? Probably 60s, 70s maybe? Said, I, I'm not a Christian. So some of you may say, what you just described was not me. So I don't even know if I'm a believer. So we're going to pray over you as well. Praise God. You need to come just a minute, moment longer. And you can kneel, you can stand, you do whatever you feel comfortable doing, but I'm just going to pray. And we're going to trust God. And he's going to set free whatever needs to be set free. If you're standing in the gap for someone, we're going to pray for that too. Amen. You come. Others are coming. Amen. Amen. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for those who are coming right now and responding publicly. I know it's a big deal to do, but we believe, God, that a heart that's desperate will desperately do anything for healing and comfort and peace. And God, I don't know all of the challenges here right now. I have to believe some are here and saying, I don't even think I know the Lord. I, I know of Jesus, but I haven't been born again. I'm I don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit living within me, but I want that. And so God, for those who are saying that, I pray they would just cry out to you through repentance, admitting that they can't save themselves and receiving by faith Jesus and saying, I believe Jesus is the Savior. And God, you would radically save them. And more importantly, God, fill them with your spirit right now. You're indwelling Holy Spirit. Spirit And God, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So would you fill us all, everyone who's come forward, God, and set them free, God, from addiction or uh, emotional despair, God, or immorality or idolatry or worship of other things that are not pleasing to you or pride or anything else, God, that would separate. And I pray right now, God, that they would leave this place different than the way they came in. And God, they would tell somebody of the decision that they made within. We love you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. Without him, none of this would be possible. And we ask it in his name.